Hi everyone! I have completed first 15 chapters of class 11th and CRT. If you have missed any please check from the playlist. Let's start with chapter 16. Excretory products and their elimination. Animals accumulate ammonia, urea, uric acid, carbon dioxide, water and ions like sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions, phosphate, sulfate, etc. either by metabolic activities or by other means like excess ingestion. These substances have to be removed totally or partially. In this chapter, you will learn the mechanisms of elimination of these substances with special emphasis on common nitrogenous wastes. Ammonia, urea and uric acid are the major forms of nitrogenous wastes excreted by the animals. Ammonia is the most toxic form and requires large amount of water for its elimination, whereas uric acid, being the least toxic, can be removed with a minimum loss of water. The process of excreting ammonia is ammonotelism. Many bony fishes, aquatic amphibians and aquatic insects are ammonotelic in nature. Ammonia, as it is readily soluble, is generally excreted by diffusion across body surfaces or through gill surfaces, in fish, as ammonium ions. Kidneys do not play any significant role in its removal. Terrestrial adaptation necessitated the production of lesser toxic nitrogenous wastes like urea and uric acid for conservation of water. Mammals, many terrestrial amphibians and marine fishes mainly excrete urea and are called ureatelic animals. Ammonia produced by metabolism is converted into urea in the liver of these animals and released into the blood which is filtered and excreted out by the kidneys. Some amount of urea may be retained in the kidney matrix of some of these animals to maintain a desired osmolarity. Reptiles, birds, land snails, and insects excrete nitrogenous wastes as uric acid in the form of pellet or paste with a minimum loss of water and are called uricatalic animals. A survey of animal kingdom presents a variety of excretory structures. In most of the invertebrates, these structures are simple tubular forms whereas vertebrates have complex tubular organs called kidneys. Some of these structures are mentioned here. Protonephridia or flame cells are the excretory structures in platyhelminths, flatworms, example, planaria, rotifers, some annelids, and the cephalochordate, amphioxus. Protonephridia are primarily concerned with ionic and fluid volume regulation, i.e., osmoregulation. Nephridia are the tubular excretory structures of earthworms and other annelids. Nephridia help to remove nitrogenous wastes and maintain a fluid and ionic balance. Malpighian tubules are the excretory structures of most of the insects including cockroaches. Malpighian tubules help in the removal of nitrogenous wastes and osmoregulation. Antennal glands or green glands perform the excretory function in crustaceans like prawns. 16.1 Human Excretory System in humans, the excretory system consists of a pair of kidneys, one pair of ureters, a urinary bladder and a urethra, figure 16.1. Kidneys are reddish-brown, bean-shaped structures situated between the levels of last thoracic and third lumbar vertebra close to the dorsal inner wall of the abdominal cavity. Each kidney of an adult human measures 10 to 12 centimeters in length, 5 to 7 centimeters in width, 2 to 3 centimeters in thickness with an average weight of 120 170 grams towards the center of the inner concave surface of the kidney is a notch called hilum through which your reader, blood vessels and nerves enter. Inner to the hilum is a broad funnel shaped space called the renal pelvis with projections called calyces. The outer layer of kidney is a tough capsule. Inside the kidney, there are two zones, an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The medulla is divided into a few conical masses, medullary pyramids, projecting into the calyces, sing, calyx. The cortex extends in between the medullary pyramids as renal columns called columns of Bertini, figure 16.2. 
Each kidney has nearly 1 million complex tubular structures called nephrons, figure 16.3, which are the functional units. Each nephron has two parts, the glomerulus and the renal tubule. Glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries formed by the afferent arteriole, a fine branch of renal artery. Blood from the glomerulus is carried away by an efferent arteriole. The renal tubule begins with a double-walled cup-like structure called Bowman's capsule, which encloses the glomerulus. Glomerulus along with Bowman's capsule is called the Malpighian body or renal corpuscle, figure 16.4. The tubule continues further to form a highly coiled network, proximal convoluted tubule, PCT. A hairpin-shaped Henley's loop is the next part of the tubule which has a descending and an ascending limb. The ascending limb continues as another highly coiled tubular region called distal convoluted tubule, DCT. The DCTs of many nephrons open into a straight tube called collecting duct, many of which converge and open into the renal pelvis through medullary pyramids and the calyces. The Malpighian corpuscle, PCT and DCT of the nephron are situated in the cortical region of the kidney whereas the loop of Henle dips into the medulla. In majority of nephrons, the loop of Henle is too short and extends only very little into the medulla. Such nephrons are called cortical nephrons. In some of the nephrons, the loop of Henle is very long and runs deep into the medulla. These nephrons are called juxtamedullary nephrons. The efferent arteriole emerging from the glomerulus forms a fine capillary network around the renal tubule called the peritubular capillaries. A minute vessel of this network runs parallel to the Henle's loop forming a U-shaped vasa recta. Vasa recta is absent or highly reduced in cortical nephrons. 16.2 Urine Formation Urine formation involves three main processes namely, glomerular filtration, reabsorption and secretion, that takes place in different parts of the nephron. The first step in urine formation is the filtration of blood, which is carried out by the glomerulus and is called glomerular filtration. On an average, 1,100 to 1,200 milliliters of blood is filtered by the kidneys per minute which constitute roughly 1-5 th of the blood pumped out by each ventricle of the heart in a minute. The glomerular capillary blood pressure causes filtration of blood through three layers, that is, the endothelium of glomerular blood vessels, the epithelium of Bowman's capsule and a basement membrane between these two layers. The epithelial cells of Bowman's capsule called podocytes are arranged in an intricate manner so as to leave some minute spaces called filtration slits or slit pores. Blood is filtered so finely through these membranes that almost all the constituents of the plasma except the proteins pass onto the lumen of the Bowman's capsule. Therefore, it is considered as a process of ultrafiltration. The amount of the filtrate formed by the kidneys per minute is called glomerular filtration rate GFR. GFR in a healthy individual is approximately 125 milliliters per minute, i.e., 180 liters per day. The kidneys have built-in mechanisms for the regulation of glomerular filtration rate. One such efficient mechanism is carried out by juxtaglomerular apparatus JGA. JGA is a special sensitive region formed by cellular modifications in the distal convoluted tubule and the afferent arteriole at the location of their contact. A fall in GFR can activate the JG cells to release renin which can stimulate the glomerular blood flow and thereby the GFR back to normal. A comparison of the volume of the filtrate formed per day, 180 liters per day, with that of the urine released, 1.5 liters, suggests that nearly 99% of the filtrate has to be reabsorbed by the renal tubules. This process is called reabsorption. The tubular epithelial cells in different segments of nephron perform this either by active or passive mechanisms. For example, substances like glucose, amino acids, Na+, etc., in the filtrate are reabsorbed actively whereas the nitrogenous wastes are absorbed by passive transport. 
Reabsorption of water also occurs passively in the initial segments of the nephron, figure 16.5. During urine formation, the tubular cells secrete substances like H+, K+, and ammonia into the filtrate. Tubular secretion is also an important step in urine formation as it helps in the maintenance of ionic and acid-base balance of body fluids. 16.3 Function of the Tubules Proximal Convoluted Tubule PCT. PCT is lined by simple cuboidal brush border epithelium which increases the surface area for reabsorption. Nearly all of the essential nutrients and 70 to 80 percent of electrolytes and water are reabsorbed by this segment. PCT also helps to maintain the pH and ionic balance of the body fluids by selective secretion of hydrogen ions and ammonia into the filtrate and by absorption of HCO3 from it. Henley's Loop Reabsorption is minimum in its ascending limb. However, this region plays a significant role in the maintenance of high osmolarity of metallary interstitial fluid. The descending limb of loop of Henle is permeable to water but almost impermeable to electrolytes. This concentrates the filtrate as it moves down. The ascending limb is impermeable to water but allows transport of electrolytes actively or passively. Therefore, as the concentrated filtrate pass upward, it gets diluted due to the passage of electrolytes to the metallary fluid. Distal convoluted tubule DCT. Conditional reabsorption of Na plus and water takes place in this segment. DCT is also capable of reabsorption of HCO3 and selective secretion of hydrogen and potassium ions and NH3 to maintain the pH and sodium potassium balance in blood. Collecting duct. This long duct extends from the cortex of the kidney to the inner parts of the medulla. Large amounts of water could be reabsorbed from this region to produce a concentrated urine. This segment allows passage of small amounts of urea into the metallary interstitium to keep up the osmolarity. It also plays a role in the maintenance of pH and ionic balance of blood by the selective secretion of H plus and K plus ions, figure 16.5. 16.4 Mechanism of Concentration of the Filtrate Mammals have the ability to produce a concentrated urine. The Henle's loop and vasa recta play a significant role in this. The flow of filtrate in the two limbs of Henle's loop is in opposite directions and thus forms a countercurrent. The flow of blood through the two limbs of vasa recta is also in a countercurrent pattern. The proximity between the Henle's loop and vasa recta as well as the countercurrent in them help in maintaining an increasing osmolarity towards the inner metallary interstitium, i.e., from 300 milliosmol per liter in the cortex to about 1200 milliosmol per liter in the inner medulla. This gradient is mainly caused by NaCl and urea. NaCl is transported by the ascending limb of Henle's loop which is exchanged with the descending limb of vasa recta. NaCl is returned to the interstitium by the ascending portion of vasa recta. Similarly, small amounts of urea enter the thin segment of the ascending limb of Henle's loop which is transported back to the interstitium by the collecting tubule. The above described transport of substances facilitated by the special arrangement of Henle's loop and vasa recta is called the countercurrent mechanism, figure. 16.6 this mechanism helps to maintain a concentration gradient in the metallary interstitium. Presence of such interstitial gradient helps in an easy passage of water from the collecting tubule thereby concentrating the filtrate, urine. Human kidneys can produce urine nearly four times concentrated than the initial filtrate formed. 16.5 Regulation of Kidney Function the functioning of the kidneys is efficiently monitored and regulated by hormonal feedback mechanisms involving the hypothalamus, JGA, and to a certain extent, the heart. Osmoreceptors in the body are activated by changes in blood volume, body fluid volume and ionic concentration. 
An excessive loss of fluid from the body can activate these receptors which stimulate the hypothalamus to release antidiuretic hormone ADH or vasopressin from the neurohypophysis. ADH facilitates water reabsorption from latter parts of the tubule, thereby preventing diuresis. An increase in body fluid volume can switch off the OSWA receptors and suppress the ADH release to complete the feedback. ADH can also affect the kidney function by its constrictory effects on blood vessels. This causes an increase in blood pressure. An increase in blood pressure can increase the glomerular blood flow and thereby the GFR. The JGA plays a complex regulatory role. A fall in glomerular blood flow slash glomerular blood pressure slash GFR can activate the JG cells to release renin which converts angiotensinogen in blood to angiotensinite and further to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, being a powerful vasoconstrictor, increases the glomerular blood pressure and thereby GFR. Angiotensin 2 also activates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone causes reabsorption of Na plus and water from the distal parts of the tubule. This also leads to an increase in blood pressure and GFR. This complex mechanism is generally known as the renin-angiotensin mechanism. An increase in blood flow to the atria of the heart can cause the release of atrial natriuretic factor ANF. ANF can cause vasodilation, dilation of blood vessels, and thereby decrease the blood pressure. ANF mechanism, therefore, acts as a check on the renin-angiotensin mechanism. 16.6 Micturition Urine formed by the nephrons is ultimately carried to the urinary bladder where it is stored till a voluntary signal is given by the central nervous system CNS. This signal is initiated by the stretching of the urinary bladder as it gets filled with urine. In response, the stretch receptors on the walls of the bladder send signals to the CNS. The CNS passes on motor messages to initiate the contraction of smooth muscles of the bladder and simultaneous relaxation of the urethral sphincter causing the release of urine. The process of release of urine is called micturition and the neural mechanisms causing it is called the micturition reflex. An adult human excretes, on an average, 1 to 1.5 liters of urine per day. The urine formed is a light yellow colored watery fluid which is slightly acidic, pH 6.0, and has a characteristic odor. On an average, 25 to 30 gram of urea is excreted out per day. Various conditions can affect the characteristics of urine. Analysis of urine helps in clinical diagnosis of many metabolic disorders as well as malfunctioning of the kidney. For example, presence of glucose, glycosuria, and ketone bodies ketonuria, in urine are indicative of diabetes mellitus. 16.7 Role of Other Organs in Excretion other than the kidneys, lungs, liver and skin also help in the elimination of excretory wastes. Our lungs remove large amounts of CO2, approximately 200 ml slash minute, and also significant quantities of water every day. Liver, the largest gland in our body, secretes bile-containing substances like bilirubin, biliverdin, cholesterol, degraded steroid hormones, vitamins, and drugs. Most of these substances ultimately pass out along with digestive wastes. The sweat and sebaceous glands in the skin can eliminate certain substances through their secretions. Sweat produced by the sweat glands is a watery fluid containing NaCl, small amounts of urea, lactic acid, etc. Though the primary function of sweat is to facilitate a cooling effect on the body surface, it also helps in the removal of some of the wastes mentioned above. Sebaceous glands eliminate certain substances like sterols, hydrocarbons, and waxes through sebum. This secretion provides a protective oily covering for the skin. Do you know that small amounts of nitrogenous wastes could be eliminated through saliva too? 16.8 Disorders of the Excretory System 
Malfunctioning of kidneys can lead to accumulation of urea in blood, a condition called uremia, which is highly harmful and may lead to kidney failure. In such patients, urea can be removed by a process called hemodialysis. During the process of hemodialysis, the blood drained from a convenient artery is pumped into a dialyzing unit called artificial kidney. Blood drained from a convenient artery is pumped into a dialyzing unit after adding an anticoagulant like heparin. The unit contains a coiled cellophane tube surrounded by a fluid, dialyzing fluid, having the same composition as that of plasma except the nitrogenous wastes. The porous cellophane membranes of the tube allows the passage of molecules based on concentration gradient. As nitrogenous wastes are absent in the dialyzing fluid, these substances freely move out, thereby clearing the blood. The cleared blood is pumped back to the body through a vein after adding antiheparin to it. This method is a boon for thousands of uremic patients all over the world. Kidney transplantation is the ultimate method in the correction of acute renal failures, kidney failure. A functioning kidney is used in transplantation from a donor, preferably a close relative, to minimize its chances of rejection by the immune system of the host. Modern clinical procedures have increased the success rate of such a complicated technique. Renal calculi. Stone or insoluble mass of crystallized salts, oxalates, etc., formed within the kidney. Glomerulonephritis. Inflammation of glomeruli of kidney. And that's the end of chapter 16. Hope it was worth listening and you learned few pronunciations too. Please do like this video, share and subscribe if you have until now. Stay tuned for chapter 17. Thank you.